Hey guys, happy new year. Welcome to the uh, first 2017 episode of Tuesday Tune. I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed your holiday break. Uh, we made the most of it, started making stuff. So this week on the Tuesday Tune, we're going to talk about single tube shocks and twin tube shocks. Twin tube shocks being most commonly known as uh, the Owens TTX style of shock, uh, which is also found, a layout also found in the Fox DHX2 and Float X2, as well as the Cane Creek Double Barrel series. So the most obvious thing to understand about the difference is the difference in the way oil flows around the damper. So in a single tube shock over here, which is something like a RC4 or a DBO Jade Van RC and so forth. What we have is basically the main shock body uh, in all layouts that we find in the mountain bike world anyway. Main shock body, a damper shaft, a damper piston here, uh, and basically what happens as the volume of this shaft enters the damper body, that volume of oil is then pushed around through this compression circuit up here and into the reservoir. The reservoir is gas charged. The volume of oil here that isn't displaced up through the compression adjuster there is forced instead through the main piston and ends up behind here. So what we basically, uh, what we'll typically have is the majority of the damping force um, being generated over the, uh, the main piston here. The reason for this is that the surface area in here is larger than the surface area of the shaft. Force is equal to pressure times area. Uh, easiest way to get a bigger force when we're dealing with pressures is to increase the area rather than the pressure. So what can happen here if there isn't sufficient damping over, uh, not a sufficient pressure drop, sorry, over the uh, compression circuit here or there's not enough of a gas charge pressure to actually force oil through this main piston here uh, at high enough speeds, then what will happen is essentially the whole volume pushed by the main piston gets displaced into the reservoir. And wh when that happens, it's because the pressure ahead of here, so the pressure on this side of the piston isn't high enough to push oil through the piston fast enough. And what that results in is essentially drawing a vacuum behind here now, this is known as cavitation. So, cavitation, I very commonly hear uh, incorrectly described as foaming of the oil. That isn't what it is. Cavitation is a purely dynamic effect. So, that is a possible consequence of a particular configuration of that damper. As a result, a lot of production uh, dampers in the mountain bike world have very lightly valved main piston, so that uh, that isn't really a risk. Anyway, in the rebound stroke, so this is now pulling apart this way. The oil that's trapped in here is now forced through the piston here and through the shim stacks there, uh, or the low speed rebound adjuster orifice. That oil basically squeezed in between the piston and here, and that provides pressure. So there can be no cavitation in the reverse stroke there, unless the check valve that's here, uh, the one way valve up here, is uh, too strong essentially for the gas charge there. That isn't really the case on anything other than the uh, Fox Evolution dampers uh, in some of their uh, forks, funnily enough. Story for another time. So, let's have a look at the way that a twin tube shock works instead. So, same sort of deal, except how much oil flows through the piston here is not fixed. It's not necessarily just this volume, let like swept volume of the piston minus the uh, displacement of the shaft. The amount of oil that flows through the piston can be zero. So the piston can be solid, it can have a preloaded shim stack when it's moving at slow enough speeds, and in that case, all the oil pushed by the piston will go through the compression circuit and into the reservoir here. Now the important part of the twin tube shock is that the reservoir pressure will then provide uh, essentially a pressure that forces the oil through the check valve in the rebound uh, in the rebound adjuster here, in the rebound damping circuit, and back around through the between the inner and outer tubes, and then back around behind the piston. In rebound, the opposite is happening, things extending, that oil in there is either being forced through the piston or it's coming up and being forced through this rebound adjuster up here. So the way that I've labeled, the way that I've drawn these, sorry, is blue is uh, compression, red is rebound. Seems to be standard nomenclature for some reason in the bike world. 
So what is the real world difference here? The real world difference is that you can have a huge pressure drop over this piston. In fact, this piston can be completely solid as it was in some of the early Olin's TTX shocks. And then you have this entire volume of oil being pushed through that circuit. Now, the surface area of that piston is obviously very large compared to the surface area of the shaft, the cross-sectional area of the shaft. And so what that means is that with very low pressure here, we can build up a lot of damping force. This is extremely useful in car racing uh, or any kind of road racing uh, suspension. So be that Formula One, uh, you know, NASCAR, MotoGP, whatever it may be. The reason that that is important is because basically damping lag or hysteresis arises from the elasticity of the whole system. So once you, if you have a large uh, damping force arising from only low pressure, then you're not having to physically expand the tube much. You're not having to seat all the O-rings and everything back in their grooves and compress all that. You're not having to compress the oil and so forth. Uh, and basically, because you are pushing such a large volume of oil through the adjuster, uh, that damping force is built up very, very quickly. So what that results in, uh, again, is a very low hysteresis uh, damping design. That is of huge consequence uh, to road going vehicles, not so much to mountain bikes. However, there is another important advantage, particularly with uh, a layout like Cane Creek uses or Fox use for the uh, DHX2 series. You can make this shaft very, very small and have very little uh, net oil displacement into here. The result of that is that a smaller shaft here means lower friction, uh, lighter weight, you can make a smaller reservoir with less effect of the friction from the IFP on this shaft because basically the distance that moves is dictated by the relative diameters of the IFP, the internal floating piston here, and the damper shaft. So the smaller that is, the less far that moves, the more mechanical advantage that the damper shaft has over it. A further advantage of this system is that because uh, you can basically refill behind the piston from the reservoir directly there. The risk of cavitation is extremely low. The only way cavitation can really occur is in drawing a vacuum behind here, is if, again, this gas pressure isn't actually high enough to force oil through the check valve in the rebound assembly fast enough. That doesn't take a lot of pressure. The check valves are extremely weak. Um, so then we have a very good system. It's very robust. We can run it at you know, relatively low pressure, there's low gas charge force. Anyone that's tried to compress, say, an old RC4 by hand uh, with the spring off versus a double barrel coil by hand with the spring off, you'll notice the difference that the IFP charge has there. So that can be, that can be beneficial in those ways. In this one, uh, by necessity, in order to get a substantial amount of damping force through uh, the compression adjuster up here, you need to have a relatively large diameter shaft. There's also a minimum diameter that you can realistically have in order to be able to have uh, the rebound adjuster up through the middle of it because we don't have the opportunity to run the rebound adjuster up in the bridge there. So let's talk about uh, some of the potential shortcomings of each design. So as I mentioned with single tube design here, cavitation uh, is a potential issue if it isn't valved and set up correctly. Um, in the twin tube design, uh, one design limitation, if it's laid out in exactly this manner, is that if you have a high and low speed rebound adjuster up here, uh, as both Fox and Cane Creek use, then you're limited to a digressive rebound curve. And if that's what you want, great. However, all high and low speed adjusters like that tend to have that characteristic. Owens uh, have changed up their design by basically taking this piston that has the rebound adjuster in there and putting it in here instead of up in the bridge. And that means they also have a check valve there so that this, uh, this oil flow can only occur in that direction in compression, not in rebound. So why would I say that, that is a limitation that we can only run a digressive rebound curve? Well, using um, having your entire rebound assembly contained within the main piston and damp shaft assembly means that you can have pretty much whatever damp curve shape you want. Um, now that's not to say that in theory you couldn't run it uh, like a shim stack up here instead of um, like a preloaded popper valve, 
but that configuration doesn't currently exist. Now, one thing really worth mentioning here is that, in theory, you can develop any damp curve you like from either of these layouts. You can get either of them to perform with sufficiently low hysteresis if it's valved correctly. What the real advantage of the twin tube systems is, in my opinion, is that it allows manufacturers to create something with a very wide external range of adjustment that is much more difficult to do with one of these if you want to get the same uh, hysteresis characteristics and whatnot. In that sense, it is a bit more versatile. If we're looking for outright performance, you know, if everything was custom built in an ideal world for the bike, the rider, uh, the riding conditions, the difference then is much, much smaller on a mountain bike. Um, in the automotive world, that is a great setup. Uh, when low hysteresis is required, this has its limitations there. In the mountain bike world, that's a lot less important, and so that theoretical advantage really adds up to a lot less. Anyway guys, that's it for this week's Tuesday Tune. Uh, let us know what you liked, didn't like, any feedback is always appreciated, and we'll see you next week.